This is City News Everywhere. Good evening. We begin with a story that might add to your to-do list tonight. Gas prices are about to go up again. Shauna Hunt explains how high it could go. In a matter of days, the price of gas will have risen by about 20 cents a liter as another hike is expected at midnight. And some analysts warn that we're starting to creep back up to that $2 mark. It's harder for the seniors than I guess for everybody else. The price is ridiculous. It's been a challenging year with soaring food prices and inflation putting the squeeze on family budgets and now gas prices are once again inching back up. This weekend, the price at the pumps across the GTA will hit $1.81 a litre, a rise of two dimes since Tuesday, and the highest drivers have had to pay since late July. I wish they could lower the diesel gas, diesel prices. Diesel's really that's impacting the, you? Yeah, that's the worst one. Energy experts are blaming the sharp increase on supply and demand issues, Russia's war on Ukraine and the weak Canadian dollar. And as winter arrives, it's believed that prices could once again be hitting two bucks a litre. One factor is the provincial government's six cent a litre cut to the gas tax. That expires at the end of December, meaning we'll start the new year at the normal rate. What this does to the everyday driver and the transportation costs of everything and does this just continue to fuel inflationary pressures because it makes the cost of pretty much doing anything get more expensive. Right now, gas prices are 30 to 40 cents higher compared to last year's levels, and it's been a bit of a roller coaster. Back in June, we hit an all-time high of $2.15 a litre, and by September, we were back down to a buck 40. Since then, it's been a slow climb, and drivers have had to adjust. Day-to-day -day life, it's still, you got to account for it, right? You got to build it into the budget, even though it might not actually be there, but you still got to get to where you're going. Now, the climb over the next few months will be gradual. For example, on Sunday, gas prices are expected to fall by a couple of cents. Shauna Hunt, City News. This supportive housing project by the city has had residents in the Willowdale area fighting back for months. But it seems their latest efforts have hit a bump in the road based on a simple matter of timing. We feel that the, the seniors living at the 175 Kammer were not uh, given a chance to uh, you know, raise their concerns and have their questions answered, even though it has been promised many different times. The modular housing plans the city put forth look pleasant enough, but there's still not enough to win over the people in Willowdale. The latest effort to stymie the project meant to support the city's homeless was an appeal to the Ontario Land Tribunal, but they've been told it missed the deadline by one day. Now we're just basically trying to, you know, get some more clarification around it, um, to like what really happened to the appeal letters and why were they not logged, I guess, or received by August 18th deadline. A lawyer representing the neighborhood group claims the appeal was in fact filed on time, saying it was an administrative misunderstanding, and they are confident there will be a hearing to continue the fight. Newly elected city councillor Lily Cheng has worked as a champion for those in need as part of a local not-for-profit group, but says there is also a need to involve communities in the process. I've spent the last few years serving people who live in low-income neighborhoods and, and I do feel uh, in general that when we put a large group of people who have complex needs and they're not well supported, uh, the outcomes are not positive. While the province is pushing for more housing in general to be built, this particular project is one that Queen's Park hasn't supported, despite its ability to fast-track the zoning. Mayor John Tory has been very vocal about the support of housing that has been built in the city to date and the need to push projects like this forward. Cheng says she's aware but wants the process to be more balanced. I am definitely going to have that conversation soon and I know it is a priority for him and I want him to know that I genuinely care about the homeless and I want us to find sustainable solutions and I also feel though that we do need clear guidelines of where we put supportive housing. Mark McAllister, City News.
On city streets, police are on the Danforth this hour searching for a suspect wanted in a fatal brazen daylight shooting. Officers were called to Danforth and Donlins Avenues around 315 for reports a man had been shot. The victim was pronounced dead on scene. Witnesses say a suspect was seen fleeing the area, but no description is available at this time. More than two dozen guests are suing Thermia Spa Village after allegedly contracting serious health problems from the Whitney facility. The plaintiffs claim they experienced severe symptoms, including hearing loss and skin rashes. Earlier this month, local public health officials detected staph and pseudonymonia's bacteria in the spa's saltwater pool. The spa then closed the pool and others to audit their facilities. Plaintiff's lawyer noted that there were several major issues with the inspection and maintenance of the pools before the spa's opening on October 6th. Spa management say they followed all safety directions and certifications. And York Regional Police have charged the driver of a dump truck involved in a deadly crash in Markham earlier this month. On October 12th, the truck collided with an Acura carrying three passengers in the area of Markham Road and Elson Street, just north of Steeles. The Acura's 21-year-old male driver and 23-year-old female passenger were pronounced dead on scene. A 54-year-old woman remains in hospital in critical condition. The truck driver was uninjured and remained on scene. 46-year-old Anthony Baglieri of Vaughn has been charged with two counts of dangerous driving causing death and one count of dangerous driving causing bodily harm. There wasn't one convoy ever. There were multiple convoys and there were multiple other individuals and small groups and I think uh, it's Superintendent Morris used better language than I will, but affiliated groups that joined or, or left on a daily basis. He was the man in charge of Ottawa police when tens of thousands of anti-COVID vaccine mandate protesters came to the nation's capital. The man who once said there may not be a policing solution to the convoy and who resigned just days before a combined police force violently cleared protesters. At the Emergencies Act inquiry, former Chief Peter Slowly explains how events unfolded from the chief's chair. What we saw in terms of a violation of our community's rights, our business community's rights, the level of unlawfulness and assaultiveness in the broadest sense of that term, including the literal sense of that term, was not what we expected and was overwhelming, not just for the Ottawa Police Service, most importantly, it was overwhelming for those communities that were most directly impacted by those events that weekend and every other day after that. Slowly explains that as late as 9 a.m. on the first Saturday, Ottawa police were still operating on the assumption protests would last three days. The nine o'clock briefing that I received on the Saturday morning, the 29th, was still talking about a weekend event. It described we might have a tent city at the end of this. My understanding and my observation was by 11 o'clock, we had an, an, a significantly embedded, clearly beginning to occupy, and in some cases fortify, elements of Wellington Street, the Parliamentary District, and other parts of our downtown core. Slowly echoed other Ottawa police witnesses who said they felt intel suggested the protest wouldn't stay, despite OPP intelligence reports detailing protesters were highly motivated and long-term occupation was possible. But Slowly shed further light on a police service sometimes at odds with itself. Documents revealed that at one point police negotiators tried to strike a deal with protesters at Confederation Park, but just two hours later, police under a different unit arrived to begin enforcement. At another point, the OPS incident commander was replaced and slowly was not notified for five days. At best, I can call this a significant lack of judgment on behalf of my two operational deputies. At worst, Probably this would have been a review that I would have done after the events had concluded and looked at it even more closely. Did your level of trust in your two deputies change from that point on? Yes. Uh, did they regain your trust afterwards? Significantly. But at that point, it was low. In Ottawa, Shaoli Lee, City News. It's a bluebird day for Elon Musk, but clouds of uncertainty are in the forecast 
as the world's richest man takes over Twitter for 44 billion bucks after months of roller coaster drama and legal wrangling. So the easy part was buying Twitter. The hard part's going to be fixing it. American tech analyst Dan Ives outlining some of the challenges ahead for Tesla's CEO, who is now at the helm of the social media platform. Questions are swirling over freedom of speech. Will he end the ban on former U.S. President Donald Trump? And what about monetization as the company that Musk himself admits he overpaid for goes private? Twitter, as pervasive as it is, it's basically been a treadmill stock, a troubled asset. He has a lot of wood to chop. I think there's going to be probably a paid subscription piece. He's going to have to increase engagement. Clearly, headcount cuts will be on the horizon. Already, he's reportedly fired several top execs. One of his first apparent moves, after tweeting overnight, the bird is freed. That on the heels of his pun-filled visit to Twitter headquarters this week. Let that sink in, he posted, while carrying a sink. And he's given himself the title of chief twit. The dad jokes seemingly falling flat, though, for regulators in places like the European Union. The framework that um, that any company operating in Europe has to um, has to comply with it's said to be referring to things like hate speech and criminal activities. One official tweeting in Europe, the bird will fly by our EU rules. Exactly what Musk has planned for Twitter's future, it's up in the air. The 51 year old who also runs rocket company SpaceX has publicly brainstormed an idea of building a super app, offering everything from money transfers to shopping and ride hailing. A message Thursday directed at advertisers addressing their worries. Musk tweeting, Twitter obviously cannot become a free for all hellscape where anything could be said with no consequences. And we are hearing from Musk Friday on where else but Twitter. He posted, Twitter will be forming a content moderation council with widely diverse viewpoints, he says. And no content decisions will be made until that council convenes. A company-wide meeting with Twitter employees, that reportedly set for next week. Melissa Duggan, City News. All right, do you have your Halloween costume? Because these little pooches do out in Liberty Village. Look at all of them. This is uh, Liberty Pooch. And so they are showcasing all of the costumes. Oh, look, it's a dog. No, it's a lion. Oh, no, it's a dog. That's what's happening right now. I love that they're all into it. And listen, all of your Halloween costume parties this weekend are going to be rain-free. A little bit on the cool side, but really it's seasonal for this time of year. So rain-free, you know when the rain comes back? Just in time for the little ones for trick-or-treat time on Monday afternoon and, and continuing into the evening as well. Uh, it's going to be a bit of a frosty night, but like I said, these are seasonal uh, temperatures and seasonal advisories for this time of year. That frost advisory is back for the the second night in a row. Uh, overnight lows are going to just edge to about one, just tickling zero. So if you do have to scrape the uh, windshield, it's not going to be in the downtown core. It's going to be off to the north, and it'll likely be a quick scrape because we're not going to hover below the freezing mark for very long. Uh, we had a little bit of cloud to the south today, so hugging the Niagara Peninsula and uh, the south GTA, that's what's left of it now. It continues to push to the south and east, so sky's clearing as we speak, and then high pressure is behind it, and that's going to keep those skies cloud free as we go into tomorrow. So there's the last of the cloud leaving. There's your Saturday morning. It's sunny. There's your Saturday afternoon. It's sunny. And here comes Sunday morning. Now I'm going to focus in on this right here. This is going to be some morning fog. So places like the QEW, the Gardner, uh, and Lakeshore could be into that fog and reduced visibility. So keep that in mind if you are heading out early morning on Sunday. Once that fog lifts, it's going to be dry through the afternoon, but you can see it's more of a mix in, of sun and cloud type of day compared to tomorrow. So this evening, head out for a walk uh, after dinner, 7 degrees. It's clear, it's crisp, and we've got fairly light winds out there at about 15 to 20 kilometers per hour. There's your uh, aerial forecast for tomorrow. A little bit of cloud may sneak into Hamilton. Hamilton and Grimsby. But other than that, uh, we are talking about wall-to-wall -wall sunshine. Average high for this time of year is about 11 degrees. We're getting to 14, so we are also slightly above seasonal. Speaking of above seasonal, we are talking about a very warm start to November. In fact, the first seven, possibly eight days, are going to be running well above seasonal. I'll have those details coming up in the seven-day forecast. 
City News weather is brought to you by Lastman's Bad Boy. Who's better than Bad Boy? Nobody. Nobody's better, nobody. A Toronto talent agency is under investigation after more than 50 actors claim they are owed a substantial amount of money for work they've already completed. Meanwhile, the founder of Compass Artist Management tells us he has lost everything after ceasing operations. Two when Golden Madison first signed with the agency in June, she was impressed by the number of opportunities coming her way. Within a month, she was landing roles in high-profile commercials. But three months later, she says she still hadn't received a single payment. She reached out to the agency and got an unexpected reply. One of her agents was resigning. I knew right then and there that something bad had happened with the money. Last week, the agency notified its clients that operations would cease effective immediately. Madison estimates she is owed anywhere from ten to fifteen thousand dollars, and after banding together with other actors, she learned at least sixty of them are still missing funds, and twenty are owed more than five thousand dollars, including Kiriana Stanton. I was very blindsided. Stanton was working on the set of a new film in September and had to ask the production team about her missing payments. She pulled up the pay stubs and showed me that many checks had gone out, none of which I'd received. For me personally, it caused quite a lot of fear because I am unfortunately in a very precarious financial position. I have been for a while and I was very heavily relying on this paycheck to pay for my medical bills and my medications and my rent and my food. <laughs> Compass was established in May of 2020. The founder of the agency, Danny Friedman, turned down an on-camera interview but sent us a lengthy statement, part of which read, I am literally sick to my stomach about all of this. We didn't scheme to take their money to go live in mansions or yachts. I have to get a job here as I've lost everything. I don't expect anyone to feel badly for me, but please realize this wasn't some kind of scheme to take people's money and then sail off into the sunset. There's no answers there. There's nothing there. There is no facts there. Other actors tell us better protections are needed in Ontario. M. Siobhan McCourt says he is owed $4,600. I'm frustrated at them. I am frustrated at ACTRA. I am frustrated that our like system, both in Ontario and across Canada, doesn't have better systems in place to keep actors safe. ACTRA, the union representing professional performers in Canada, says the agency represented more than 200 of its members. They tell us in a statement, in other jurisdictions, notably California and British Columbia, talent agents are regulated and performers are better protected. Unfortunately, there is no such regulation in Ontario. It's time to rectify the situation and be honest about where the money is. ACTRA tells us it is industry practice for agencies to collect payments from gigs on behalf of their clients. Meanwhile, Toronto Police has confirmed they are investigating the matter. For City News, I'm Tina Yazdani.